Welcome to another of our ongoing discussions of the Book of Mormon. My name is Paul Hoskison, and I'm joined today by my colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU. On my immediate left is Camille Frank Olson. Thank you for being here. Thank you. On her left is Eric Huntsman. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Paul. And at the other end of the table is Clyde Williams, good friend and colleague. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Our discussion today will cover Alma 13 through 16. This is the ongoing mission of Alma to the city of Ammonihah. And we're gonna begin with uh, chapter 13, which gives one of the more interesting and uh, original sermons on faith and belief and pre-mortal life that we have anywhere in scripture. Uh, I, I know, Clyde, that you've uh, um, done a lot with this. I, I hope you're gonna say something here at the beginning well, on this. Get us started. Yeah, you know, when I look at this chapter I, for years, I was a bit puzzled myself as to why. Here we have, we've, Alma and Amulek have been teaching these people and they're apostate and, and, uh, and so I asked myself, why all of a sudden are we having a big discourse about Melchizedek priesthood? I thought, these guys are not ready for Melchizedek priesthood. It used to bother me. And then, and this is a heavy doctrinal yeah, absolutely, absolutely. chapter, absolutely. he's talking to apostates. Uh, yeah, and I just, I, I just thought, why on earth would he do this? And then all of a sudden, uh, it dawned me, I'm a little slow, and it, but it finally dawned on me that the whole issue here is he's talking to people who are of the profession of Nehor, priestcraft. And so we have here a great contrast between priestcraft and true priesthood. And, and in their minds, at least Zezrum and, and any others who'd care to can be comparing themselves to here's what it means to be in our priestcraft and here's what you have to do or your standards that you live. And he's going to contrast all of those here. And I thought, this is marvelous. It's powerful and beautiful. And then, of course, it came to my mind, I thought, of course, Joseph Smith is making this all up, and had the, I just I, I just can't believe that. It's no just way. so you know, remarkable. That's a great insight, Clyde. In addition to that, since you brought up the point that they are of the profession of Nehor, in addition to practicing priestcraft, we also know they were an antichrist profession. They didn't believe in Christ. And as we examine this, one of the things that strikes me so powerfully is that all this discussion about priesthood is tied to the Savior and how he's the great high priest and how high priests are a type of Christ and how the ordinances of the priesthood bring the atonement into our lives. And, and as we look at the preceding discourses of Alma and Amulek about judgment and resurrection and judgment, all these things going on, it comes together as well. Yeah. So we've got this idea of priesthood versus priestcraft and we have Christ and the Melchizedek priesthood and its ordinances as what brings all of these previous discourses to fruition. I think it's interesting that he, he calls it not Melchizedek priesthood, but the whole the order of the uh, the holy order of God. After his son, yeah. And and that's the contrast with the order of Nehor. Well, yeah. Paul, you you certainly do a lot of this with your Old Testament studies. I mean, Melchizedek. What, what does that mean in Hebrew? Doesn't it mean king of righteousness? I mean, we know there's a historical Melchizedek, but is it not also really pointing to Christ, just the very name? Yeah, the name, uh, it's always bothered me a little bit that we think that the Melchizedek priesthood is named after a mortal man, this, this wonderful man, as good and as great and as righteous as he was and as accomplished as he was in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. After the priesthood is not uh, the order of, of this mortal man. It's the order of, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and it dawned on me one day, I'm a little bit slow too, um, I don't want to say you're slow Clyde, but I'm a little slow too. His name of course means uh, the King of Righteousness. And this is a, a, a theophoric name they call it, and that's the technical term for it, where most names in the Old Testament have the, have the name of God in the name itself, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, they all contain the name of God in them. And Melchizedek's name is no different. This is one of Christ's titles, the King of Righteousness. So we have this mortal man who has this title of Christ, and we're naming the priesthood now not after the mortal man, but after the man that he represents, that is the title that he's bearing, the, the king of righteousness. Along with that, I guess we get some background information on Melchizedek in chapter 13, verse 18, that he's the king of Salem, that's Shalom, right? Prince of Peace. I mean, that's another title we associate with Jesus. Yes. 
Yes, I think it's significant as we go back to the beginning of this too, he's going to lay out the order that those who are these high priests, and, and this is the best place in, in the Book of Mormon, and it's one of the best places really in Scripture to give us some insight about the pre-mortal world or pre-mortality, because these priests were ordained, as he says here, according to the foreknowledge of God, from the foundation of the world. Let's be clear about one thing here. I, I think we're all agreed on this, and that is when he talks <coughs> about high priests and priests and priesthood here, what he's talking about are those who are ordained to the Melchizedek Melchizedek priesthood, of which this man Melchizedek was a, a prototype. Yeah. And, and so this discussion here is all about the, those who receive the Melchizedek priesthood in this life. And he's going to give us some rather astonishing doctrine here in this chapter about that. So he's not limited that. to the modern office of high priest, but it's no. all those who hold the higher yeah. priesthood, who yes. enjoy his blessings. As opposed to the Aaronic <clears throat> priesthood. That's not what he's talking about here. Yes. I think we get an, a very important insight that in pre-mortality, if we look carefully at verse 4 and 5, uh, and particularly in verse 5 it says, in fine, in the first place, i.e. in pre-mortality, they were on the same standing with their brethren. Going back to verse 4, there were those in pre-mortality who would reject the Spirit of God on account of their hardness, Lucifer and those who followed him and so on, and lost that right and privilege. <coughs> And I think uh, this this is uh, just uh, we were all we all had the same opportunity. No one was born to be a loser. No one was born to be wild. Right. It was it was their choice, and we were on the same standing. I mean, we they all had potential to to do right. Uh, even Lucifer's name means uh, light bearer or light bringer, and and he fell from that. That's what the Father had in mind for him. So I think we just see some important insights about. Well, go back to verse one, right yes. there at the yeah. very let's, beginning. Let's start at verse one. Okay, <clears throat> when he said, "I would cite your minds forward," I mean that's doing the very same thing. Is it's not the typical direction we think of for the word forward, but... Well, we, this is not the way we would say it in English. This, right. this is a translation for the plates. This is not English. So go back to the beginning. Um, yes. Even clear to the premortal life. That's what he's saying. Cite your minds forward to mm -hmm. the time when we were in our premortality, yeah. in our premortal life. When these priests, in verse 2, these priests were ordained after the order of God's Son. And for what purpose were they ordained? I it, think this is interesting. Is yeah. In a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to the Son for redemption. So doesn't that say that the more we come in contact with these who have been <clears throat> ordained to this <clears throat> higher priesthood, when they're truly living that in a way that is appropriate, they can help us to more clearly identify yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, especially since they are, at the best, a type of Christ. They're supposed to be following the Master. When it says that they are ordained in a manner whereby we can look for the Son, if these men, and we'll look at verse 3 in a moment, make themselves worthy of this call because of their choices both in premortality and this life. And how do you make yourself worthy? Right. But the point I want to make before we get there is Jesus is the ultimate example of that. He accepted the call as the firstborn. He accepted the call to be the Savior. He was faithful in all things. I mean, Christ literally means anointed. He was chosen and anointed. And so when someone is ordained at the priesthood, that is a type of the kind of selection and faithfulness we see. That, that ordination is a type and shadow of, of what Christ did for us also. Right. In, in, Which in Melchiz role. Melchizedek, as the man here on the earth, yes. becomes a type, an exact example of that Probably as the well. the premier example of that. Correct. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 3 because yes. here we get the introduction in more specific terms of what went on in our pre-mortal life. Uh, being called and prepared from the foundation of the world, which is the Book of Mormon phrase for pre-mortal life, according to the foreknowledge of God. So already in the preexistence, God foreknew us and he foreknew what we would be doing. But on our part, on account of, of our exceeding faith and our good works. Now it's interesting how that's punctuated. There, there are two possibilities of interpretation here, although I think one is more probable than the other. On account of the foreknowledge of God, is it because God knew their exceeding good works and faith that they would have, or is it because of their faith and good works and premortal life? And although both of those are possible, the Lord certainly knew it was going to happen. It, this, I think the probable <coughs> venue of interpretation raises the really interesting possibility that yes, we had agency in the premortal life, we had opportunities to exercise faith. Faith in 
Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ. Yeah. because yes. there were yes. at least one third of the yeah. group who had knowledge of Jesus but did not have faith That's sufficient safe. to follow and, him. And I think that answers a troubling question for me, why if you're in the presence of God, why, <clears throat> why does the third part of his, of his children, why do they reject this? And it seems to me that this is the answer here because they didn't have faith in Christ and in the atonement. And if you don't have faith in Christ and the atonement, you want to go with a plan that's, that doesn't require faith. That there would be one who would come and suffer and die yes. for us. That I can't do it myself. Mm -hmm. That I have to depend, trust in someone else who will do that. And the fact that we are here all of us on the earth is evidence that we chose, we chose that faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I think that's brought out there near uh, at the bottom of our page in our earliest edition here. In the first place, that is in that beginning phase, being left to choose good or evil. We were left to choose good and evil in, the pre, in our pre-mortal life. And therefore, having chosen good, that is having good acts and making good choices and exercising exceedingly great faith mm -hmm. there in the premortal life. Mm -hmm. You were called with a holy calling, namely to receive the Melchizedek priesthood. I'd like to expand that a little bit. Um, although it's specifically talking about Melchizedek priesthood holders here, uh, Joseph Smith said in, in May of 1844, every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained to that very purpose in the grand council of heaven before this world was. I suppose that I was ordained to this very office in that grand council. Mm -hmm. So uh, although Alma is talking all about a specific instance of this foreordination in the pre-earth life, I think the principle here is that there were many people called and, and foreordained and in could, that pre-earth life. And couldn't we include women? Well, I think so. Elder Maxwell used to like to always talk about foreordination for men and, and foredesignation for women, just try not to confuse the terms. But Joseph Smith, a few years earlier, when he was revealing some of the higher ordinances of the gospel, said he had turned the key for the sisters. And sisters can benefit from all the blessings of the Melchizedek priesthood, particularly through the ordinances of the temple. And they must have had the same kind of faith in good works which would put them in a position to be for designated or foreordained to receive those. Priesthood is not a gender, it's the power of God. And we see that very clearly resonated throughout these pages. I just think verse five, if it's not it, it, it clear any place else, you really can't help but see it there, right there at the end of that verse, being in and through the atonement of the only begotten Son who was prepared. Yeah. Well, and the power of that atonement, as we know from what Amalek will later teach us in Alma 34, infinite and eternal, it doesn't have any temporal bounds, let alone spatial bounds, because at the end of that verse we were examining verse 3, it talks about how they're prepared with this holy calling, which was prepared with and according to a preparatory redemption for such. Mm -hmm. This verse has told us that people could make choices. They were left to choose good or evil, and perhaps sometimes they chose evil. But what's interesting is the power of the atonement not only Enables affected them. everyone in this world before Christ came, it apparently reached back and blessed and healed and, and sanctified even those. Doesn't John teach that in Revelation, that it is through the blood of the Lamb and the testimony? Slain from word? the foundation of the world is the way it's described. Yeah. That atonement was efficacious from the very term very that we used in verse 1, from the foundation of the world. I'd like to go on here to verse 6 now and, and talk about what these people who are foreordained are supposed to do. The end of, near the end of verse yeah, 6. To teach. to teach His commandments unto the children of men. That's mm -hmm. what the foreordination is all about. And why? So that all can enter into this rest of yes. the Lord. And that the priesthood that is talking about here and your callings in the middle, uh, near the end of verse 7 also, being without beginning of days or end of years, being prepared from eternity to all eternity. There's no end to this. It starts in the premortal life and continues through this life and on into the third act of the play, our, our, our eternal existence. I think it's significant as we look at the, again, contrasting the pre he's talking about and the priests that were among the people of Ammonihah we see in verse 10 the qualifications to be this kind of a priest here on earth and that is that they have exceeding faith and they've repented and they're righteous before the Father and verse 12 they're sanctified by the Holy Ghost in that they abhor notice not adore sin. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they have and, and surely this must have really struck a chord with Jezreel as he thinks these oh, are not really? the qualifications for our priests. Yeah. And this is quite a contrast. Well, it's uh, interesting because before Zeezrom has, has asked, you know, is he going to save us in our sins? And he should have been asking from our sins. But these issues yeah. apparently were already in Zeezrom's mind. So this is probably the clincher that, as we know, yeah. pushes Zeezrom over the edge and into conversion. To me, this is very heartening, this, the part that you just talked about, Clyde, because 
uh, we know because we're here on the earth that we chose to go with the Heavenly Father's plan with Christ as the Redeemer because, and therefore we had good works and we had great faith. And, and what's called for here on this earth is the same thing all over again, is to make that fortination which you had in the preexistent life become real here in this life by faith and good works. And what's our good works? but repenting and, and repenting, choosing to choosing, follow yes. him. Yes. And then look at verse 11 where it, it, it's, it's a passive voice. We do that and then we are called. Uh, they are called, they were called, they were sanctified, mm -hmm. they were washed white, that we become clean because of Jesus Christ. He does that for us. And, and as Clyde talked about in the beginning, one of the reasons why he's bringing this up, I think, uh, and uh, you were talking about this Clyde is, because he's trying to get these people to repent. And Melchizedek had already done that with his people. Here's yeah, the example yeah. par excellence. You people of Ammonihah, you need to repent like Melchizedek's people repented. And, and Melchizedek's people brought, who brings up here were full of wickedness. <laughs> right. Yes, and because they repented, and this is, Alma's going to emphasize this in, in the middle of verse 18, um, uh, Melchizedek established peace among his people. And if you people in Ammonihah want to have peace, you need to repent also. Well, of course, we know as we finish the story that they're not going to repent and, and they're not going to enjoy peace. And the problem is in part because they're, verse 20, resting or twisting the scriptures to their own uh, convenience. And of course, then they've got to prepare themselves knowing that if they're, if they're going to be saved, they've got to do some uh, some real uh, checks on themselves. Verse 28, they've got to watch and pray continually. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't, they're going to continue to be misled as they have now for some time. And just one, just one more. Verse 16, I think there's another help that we receive, and that is the idea not only are these who are called and ordained to lead, uh, preside in this in this holy order, but the ordinances are also designed to help us to look forward on the Son of God. It being these, these ordinances, a type of his order, or it being his order, and this that they might look forward to him for a remission of their sins. I just think it's interesting again to see that same word forward, and in that case, it almost seems like it's looking, it's, re, it's inviting right. us to look in both, both directions. directions. Right. Mm -hmm. Actually looking forward, meaning <clears throat> backward to, uh, to Melchizedek and his type, and, and forward, forward to, to Christ, Christ who, yeah. who has come, sure. of whom uh, Melchizedek directions. is a type and a shadow. Well, the people here the, the, of the profession of Nehor, as you pointed out earlier, Camille, don't believe in repentance. They believe everybody is going to be saved. They don't need a savior and therefore they don't need to worry about what their sins are or even if they have any sins. And it's typical of, of uh, sinful people that when they're confronted by the call of repentance that they get angry. They get angry here. Let's well, go on and talk about what happens now after well, the actually, of that. There are a few who respond because mm -hmm. chapter 14 starts out that many did believe his yes. words and, and they began to repent and search the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that's going to become an Key operative point. point in a moment. So some begin to do that yes. and they see that their system, the order of Nehors, falls apart and apparently they're turning to the Lord and it's the others who are angry when they see that their craft is being destroyed. Zezer yeah. becomes like a man who's got six root canals waiting to be drilled and the Novocaine just worn off. <laughs> <laughs> He's literally aching from head to toe now as he realizes the pains. He's just harrowed up. It's as deep as you can put the plow. He's yeah. just really feeling it that he's he's wrong and he's misled others. And isn't it interesting, his terminology is very similar to what to Alma's, Alma's experienced. This is I, in verse six, yeah. right? I just yeah, can't help but think that Alma's r really relating well to yeah. what Zeezrom's going through. Well, and look at their response in verse eight. They reviled Zeezrom. Art mm -hmm. thou possessed with the devil? And they yeah. cast him out as well. Yeah, and others that are believing as well. So they've, they've cast out the men, apparently, yes. who believe. And now they're, they're gonna gather up the women and the children of the believers and they're going to, to, to uh, destroy them also. But notice also, as you brought up, the other thing they're going to destroy is, is the this, evidence against them, the scriptures. The scriptures. Right, yeah. They've got to get rid of the evidence, the scriptures. So now that you've gotten rid of the men, the women, the children, and the scriptures, uh, Ammonizah is being set up for its destruction. As soon as you get rid of the righteous among you, you're set up for destruction. Of course, this destroying of the women, the children, the scriptures through fire is one of the most, you know, terrible images in this part of the Book of Mormon. We see yes. these innocents suffer like this. And of course, it killed Amulek and Alma well, to watch this. Well, I wonder how many of these women and children, Amulek particularly in Zeezrom, know. I mean, you wonder yeah, if their wives or their children, yes. or at least they know these. I mean, this, this is... 
But one really of the great doctrinal lessons here, of course, in verse 11, uh, is that sometimes the Lord allows the wicked to do these things. Well, that's that right, because Amalek tries to stop it. He says, <clears> we've got right. the priesthood, let's stop let's this. Stop that, uh, but he does it that his judgments may be just, as he says here at the end of verse 11, upon these wicked. And I, I just think, uh, and, and the, also the fact that not to worry, these folks are received into His glory. They're actually in a better place. Hard for us remaining here to, to remember that, but it really is. They're in a better place and a better circumstance. So the Lord's going to make it up to them and then some. Well, and it's interesting because that's, <coughs> that's parallel with Revelation chapter 6 when, when John sees all the martyrs of his day mm -hmm. and their blood's under the altar crying out for vengeance. How and longer? how much longer, Lord? And it says, well, there's more to come. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and it's hard, as you say, <clears throat> hard is actually not doing it justice. It's terrible from our perspective yeah, yeah, right. to see innocent suffer. But Alma is willing to follow the Spirit in this, and, yeah. and in spite of his natural inclinations, I assume, to do oh, something sure. about it. Alma has to follow what the Spirit tells him. And then, of course, when Amulek asks him, are they going to burn us too? His answer is, no. You might well, wish. he says, be it according to the will yeah, of the Lord. Lord. If that's yeah. what it were, well, yeah. I'd be willing and, to and die too. And what they go through, they don't have it an easy time. Right. I mean, they I think... wish no. that they were getting burned after what they have to go and, through. And they stand there before their accusers and suffer yes. what they have. In a, in a way, Alma and Amulek, and maybe even to a certain degree, Zeezrom become types of Christ through this whole experience as they suffer pain yeah. and being outcast. They're smitten, they're spit upon. They're For three days, at. they're in prison. Right. They're right. humiliated. Food and water. Yeah. Are, For many are days. Very like interesting since you've clothing. mentioned that Melchizedek priesthood holders are supposed to be types of Christ. Yeah. Now we see our two oh. great priests here following the, the steps Even of the when Savior. they say, you know, basically, why can't you save yourself? Some of the same verbiage, even ver yeah, yeah, verse yeah. 26, yeah. you almost hear Joseph Smith in there yeah. now, as he is also a type, but how long must we suffer? And then they see the bands are broken. The bands, um, these cords with which they are tied are broken. You think about Christ who breaks the bands of death and sin. And then verse 27, um, the earth shook mightily and the walls of the prison were rent in twain. That, that terminology is just like in the four gospels yeah, of the, the tomb description. Imagery, yeah, the tomb mm -hmm. being broken open. Pretty right. remarkable. Every soul except Alma and Amulek in that prison. Yeah, the only Died. two come out alive. And it's they like, walk out. Yeah. The, the thing that strikes <clears throat> me about this is that uh, we, we talk about the sta saints being called to stand in holy places to be protected. And Amula, Alma and Amulek are standing there without their clothes, having no food, no water, no clothing. The prison walls fall down. They're spared. The only two that get out of this. You have to assume they're standing in holy places not because the prison was holy. They're holy. Yeah. Yeah, and right. they've made that's it holy. Right. That that's last right. verse in that chapter is so interesting because when the prison collapses and all these things happen, the people flee at the end of verse 29 as goats, which is an interesting image, fleeth with their young from two lions. Suddenly Alma and Amulek, who have been passive like a lamb, are suddenly, when they, there's righteous judgment being inflicted, they are suddenly lions. This is much like we see Jesus is the Lamb of God, but he's the Lion of Judah yeah. in the book of Revelation. Yes. And of course, who's on the left hand of the Savior judgment? Mm -hmm. The goats. The goats. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we yes. have all of these people fleeing like goats in front of the lions because they're once again Christ types. Yes. And, and the wicked flee when none pursue. Yeah. So yeah. all they have to do is show yeah. their face and the wicked run away. Well, and they leave. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, go over to the other land and they find Zeezrom there in, in chapter 15, and Zeezrom is really sick. Yeah, it's interesting, he hasn't caught the flu. Mm -hmm. he, 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 let's just tell you, he is literally sick inside from what, what he, yeah. he's, he's been racked with this pain, and, and, uh, and, and I think That's godly it's, sorrow. Yeah, that's exactly well, right. Well, it's interesting the emphasis on the burning fever, because we've been told before in the Book of Mormon that the torments of the wicked will be as fire and brimstone, that's and so he's suffering as yeah. if he were burning. And yeah. this is a physical suffering because of his spiritual mm -hmm. sins. It's an interesting way that it's phrased here, yes. When, when Alma talks to Zeezrom, they come to Zeezrom <laughs> and try to help him, he has a dialogue with him which actually reflects the dialogue that Alma had with the Spirit when, during his conversion. But look at that first question. He says, believest thou in the power of Christ and the salvation? That's and the bottom says, line. And says, yes, I believe everything. And then Alma says, if thou believest in the redemption of Christ, thou shalt be healed. And Zeezrom says, yea, I believe according to thy words. And then he's faithful the rest of his life. Anytime we find Zeezrom, he's yeah. teaching the gospel thereafter. So it's a remarkable story. It yes. Really is. And, uh, yes, it's a beautiful story of the conversion of this former antagonist towards Alma. And then at the end of chapter 15, 
finally Alma gets to go home. Can you imagine his relief <laughs> about being able to go home? Well, it takes yeah. Amulek with him. It takes Amulek, Amulek is with him. Now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful story of brotherhood and, and love and, yeah. and return. It says he administers to Amulek in his tribulations and strengthens him in the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Now in verse 16, we're going to get the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given back in Alma chapter 9, verse 18, when Alma first begins preaching to the people of Ammonihah. And I think it's interesting that we talk about some of these details here. That is, that the people who actually wind up destroying Ammonihah are uh, also of the order of Nehor. The Amalekites, the Lamanites, the Nephites who become Lamanites who are of the order of Nehor, actually come over and destroy all of the people in Ammonihah who are also Nehorites. And it's interesting, they're doing this because they're upset at all of the converts among their own Lamanites yes. by other Nephites, and so they're going to take it out on some Nephites and fulfill the Lord's will and not even realize it yes. in the process. In one day. In one in day, one day yeah. every soul. Mm -hmm. But that is what, what Amulek had said in Alma 10.22, if you cast out the righteous, which they did by kicking out the converts, and of course by killing the women and children who believed, then you're going to sacrifice any protection of the Lord and your enemies can destroy you. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. We have about a minute left. Clyde, can you make a summary of what we've been speaking about today? Well, you know, in my mind, this story is probably, it, it's, it has a silver lining and it has a sad point here. The sad point, of course, is all of these people in Ammonihah who were unwilling to listen and to respond. And the tragic outcome of what happens when we reject the Lord and reject the Spirit. But the silver lining is the glorious things that have happened with uh, people like uh, Amulek and that have happened with the Ezraim and who've made a tremendous change. It gives us hope that uh, even if we've made some serious mistakes, we can, we can turn our lives around and, and many others uh, who were blessed. And so for me, uh, the, the, the best thing about this whole part of the Book of Mormon here is that uh, there were those who did listen and they can be spared and they can be delivered and so can we if we'll just come to Christ and uh, follow the teachings of living prophets, which is what they did. And uh, I think that's the blessing. And, and for me, one of the great lessons out of these uh, chapters we've discussed today. Certainly is. Thank you. Thank you all for being here.